So my name is Boyd and I'm an addict. And hey everybody and Chris. Yeah, my name's Chris, I'm an addict. I wanna go ahead and tell you guys that there was uh, a while back I looked up what the definition of history was. And it is an interpretation of past events told in a chronological manner. So tonight, what you're gonna get is past events told mostly in a chronological manner, but the most important word in that particular definition is interpretation. And you are gonna get Chris's and I's interpretation of the information that we researched and gave it to Chris, he made a PowerPoint, and it, so here we are. Now, some of the source documents that we used for this presentation came from members' archives. They were the World Lit Conference minutes, they were photographs, tape recordings. We were able to get the first, the recordings of the first three World Lit Conferences uh, out of Bose archives and were able to um, digitize those and listen to them. Fellowship inputs and newsletters were another huge source of information. So we went through, we interviewed many members uh, members' talks of what, you know, there was two history uh, conferences that went on that uh, Chris and I got information from from those. Uh, we've gotten, NAWS has been uh, available to us for it. And then we've gotten, another one of our resources are these books, which are rich in history. My Years with N.A. by Bob Stone, The Story of the Basic Text by Bo S., Alone but Never Alone by Linda M., and a matter of principle, how the Narcotics Anonymous story came of age by Anonymous. Okay, and uh, I want to give you a little bit of context of what was going on during the seven rural lit conferences that created our basic text. Please, please, please keep in memory that this is an unfunded project. It started in 1979 and at the time, the World Service Office, uh, they just didn't have the money to fund a project such as this. So this members funded it themselves. And, uh, and that's, a, that's a lot to keep in mind with this. You gotta understand that the service structure was both new and very much evolving. Bo was only the very second World Lit chairperson to ever come about. The first one was uh, a guy named Mark and it was in 1977. So, or 78, excuse me. Uh, NA is actually starting to grow outside of California now. And uh, <laughs> you gotta remember there were very different forms of communication. There were newsletters, there was uh, mail, and there was these things called landlines. And believe me, the landlines, you had to pay for while in distance back then. So. Keep all that in mind. And so within that context, a couple other questions that uh, we often think about um, is how does literature impact the culture and growth of a fellowship? And where would any be without the basic text? Um, and those are kind of two questions that we think about when we're looking at this research. And, and really the reason that Boyd and I got into doing this is, you know, kind of, I guess with, when that self centeredness starts going away and you start realizing like, why am I so fortunate to be in a time and a place where Narcotics Anonymous is available? What would have happened if I was, you know, born two generations ago or three generations ago or live in a part of the world where NA is not as, de you know, developed or exposed yet? Um, and just real profound gratitude for, you know, the fact that I'm an addict today that uh, lives in a time when Narcotics Anonymous is available and has given me and given all of us just, you know, freedom in a new life. Um, so there's a, a lot of interesting history about the um, evolution of literature for addicts, but for, for Narcotics Anonymous, our fellowship, the first piece of literature that was written was in 1954. It's often referred to as the Buff Book. And it, it's in here that we see uh, step one. Uh, it's the first time that the first step was changed. Uh, it, it no longer was focused on a, a substance, but it was focused on a, condi uh, a condition. Um, and so th it's really kind of a significant historical piece that in 1954, NA made this really uh, kind of significant uh, decision around the wording of step one. 
The other thing that's interesting about the Buff Book is that it contains the just for today, and it is un unchanged. It's the one piece of literature from 1954 that still exists in our fellowship today, in our meetings, and it's completely unchanged. Uh, in 1961 or 62, the first uh, little white book was published, and it contained the 12 traditions. And again, this is where we talk about, you know, how does literature impact the culture um, of a fellowship? Because N.A. had almost died at this point, and Jimmy was so insistent that the traditions had not been followed, and that's why N.A. almost, almost died. And uh, in publishing uh, a new uh, booklet and putting the traditions in there, it was a way to embed that information into the culture. By 1966, uh, the Little White Book was published again, but now it's containing six personal stories. And you'll see, for instance, you know, at this time, you have an individual whose story is one woman's story, and she refers to herself as, I'm an addict and an alcoholic. It never was very hard for me to say I was an addict, but it was really hard for me to say I was an alcoholic. And so you still hear kind of this discussion about kind of two separate conditions, you know, and, um, and that's something that, you know, the basic text has helped uh, change as it's created literature that has become a foundation for the fellowship. So in our research, we actually came across um, a first attempt for, you know, for stories from, or, or from input from the fellowship with this letter of 1972. Now this is actually a, a draft copy right here, but the Board of Trustees actually authorizes work on a hardcover book and Greg Teague wrote this letter right here to be put out to the fellowship. Uh, and it, it talks about a World Service Office book committee. And it's asking for input for uh, a hardcover copy. And then in 1976 is when these were copyrighted. You've got the first six IPs to hit the table. And there's three of them right here which is Who, What, How, and Why, The Group, and So You Love an Attic. Then we made a decision, another look, and recovery and relapse. And if you notice, four of those in a revised form, of course, are still on our tables today. The reservation, well, maybe I can blow the weed, you know, uh, Every second Tuesday of the month, nobody be any wiser. It won't hurt me. Or I can take a few pills now and again uh, when I'm down the beach or when I go visit my aunt somewhere. I get away with it. But we know we can't. If the big AA book brings out the same idea and we laugh at it about the jaywalker, it's exactly the same way of thinking. The jaywalker who would continue to run out from the street in front of cars. In front of fire engines, in front of trolley cars, just for the thrill of beating them. They eventually one day he got hit, landed in the hospital. For a couple of days he gets out and he does the same thing again. You say, this guy is nuts. And yet this is exactly what we do. We keep doing it, doing it again, but we know we can't win. So this is, um, that was Jimmy uh, K talking in, in a NA meeting in 1962. And uh, it's interesting to us when we look at uh, this clip because, you know, that's not the type of language that we hear um, shared in a meeting and uh, today. And, and part of that is the fact that uh, at that time, you know, in 1962, they had the buff book, which was just like eight pages and they had the little white book um, but they didn't have a, a primary text, so they still relied a lot on the Alcoholics Anonymous Big Book for examples and experience, strength, and hope, and, and so forth. And, um, you know, the kind of the question of how does literature impact a fellowship, you know, the absence of a primary textbook kind of results in, in shares at that time, uh, you know, drawing from another fellowship. Uh, it's very fascinating and we've been really blessed because we've had the opportunity to do a lot of research and we actually got to see um, Jimmy's first edition uh, AA Big Book and go through it and what's fascinating is just seeing all the different people that had signed it and so we've got um, his father signing it saying dear son many happy returns to the day uh, of you and your family 
you've got uh, Jean Haig, uh, with all uh, the love of one, one NA to another. Jean uh, passed away July 10th, 2015, with 53 years of recovery. You have Penny uh, Kay and Bob B uh, signing it, and um, we'll uh, talk a little bit more about Bob uh, later in the presentation. You have his brother. Uh, uh, his brother was uh, a member of AA. And then interestingly, we have uh, Lois Wilson who signed it. And Lois is one of the co-founders of Al-Anon and um, wife of uh, Bill W, uh, co-founder of AA. All right, uh, the seventh world convention is in San Francisco in 1977. And uh, Boyd and I often pause and wonder what would have happened if Bo uh, didn't go out to San Francisco. And this is really where we see uh, kind of the spark for uh, the basic text beginning. And again, it, it wasn't because there weren't efforts. We can go back five years earlier when the Board of Trustees sent out a letter inviting the fellowship to submit input. Uh, but Bo took initiative, and it's one of the things that I reflect on about, you know, the ability of any member to take initiative to be of service and just how impactful those efforts can be um, in carrying a message. Um, this is where the process for the book really begins. Uh, please, as we're listening to him re recall this, uh, pay attention to some of the things uh, in the background, such as the uh, theme for the Seventh World Convention, uh, what they called their uh, clean time countdown, uh, who the entertainment was and so forth. We had the World Convention planned in uh, San Francisco, so I made a deal with this other guy, Tommy B, that uh, he would go out there, and if he couldn't go, I would go. But one of us would go out there. It wound up, we both went. So uh, we got out to San Francisco, and we're, can you, you are getting to know me a little bit tonight. Can you imagine, let's see. I was 29 or 30 when I got clean. So I was probably about 33 years old. So it'd be a much younger version of me walking around trying to look nonchalant, asking who's working on the book. You know, I'd say, like, it's nice weather out here. I like this convention. Who's working on the book? I mean, I was about as subtle as a brick bat. And they kept like, go over here, go over here, go over here, go over here. And I kept going wherever I was told. And within about three or four intercepts, actions like that, I wound up at registration where I met about half of the people in World Services in 15 minutes. Jimmy Cake, Chuck Skinner, bunches of them, Sally, Jack Whaley, Bob Barrett, and uh, Greg Pierce. And uh, so Jimmy says, hey, Greg, this guy's from Atlanta, and he's asking about who's working on the book. And uh, so they sent me off with Greg. They pawned me off on Greg. <laughs> and so uh, we headed off. I mean, he had read a lot of science fiction, and I was science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, uh, well, what's the score with the, uh, the book and all? And he says, well, nobody work on it. And I said, uh, is that right? Why not? And uh, the same was that Acts and Recovery can't write. So I said, so does that mean they've tried and failed or that they haven't tried? He said, well, mostly they haven't tried. I said, well, who can run on this stuff? He said, well, any member. I said, well, I'm a member. And, uh, you know, emblematically in that little conversation, you know, I was, I was thinking about all the dead people and the horrible way we die. And, uh, you know, writing's not really that goddamn hard. And uh, so anyway, with his, from the top, more or less clearance, I started writing some stuff when I went home. I mean, he took me down to some oldest meetings in, that, in the world, you know, in California and Hollywood and all that next week. But, uh, but mainly, I felt like I had permission, you know. And I felt like if I did something, that I could get other people to do stuff. So there's a lot of, you know, just 
amazing things in there. I mean, the, the theme, Now We Are Thousands, you know, back in 77, did a sobriety call uh, instead of a clean dime countdown. Asking, you know, who can write? You know, does somebody have to be appointed to do this? You know, has people tried and failed um, and so forth? And then the motivation that addicts are dying, you know, is really the thing that, that motivates people. Um, we've learned, Boyd and I, that for some of the folks that attend our presentations, that we also need to do kind of a, uh, a, an additional history, not just of Narcotics Anonymous, but some people look at the presentation and say, I don't understand what the entertainment Arm & Hammer disco was. So for our younger members, this is kind of probably what the dance looked like after the convention. So. So please, uh, please allow me to introduce you to Greg P. right now. Greg was a member of the Board of Trustees. He wrote, he co-authored with Jimmy K. the first service structure of the NA tree. He wrote IP number nine within the program. He wrote IP number 12, the Triangle of Self-Obsession. His story is in the basic text and it's titled, I Was Different. Sadly, Greg passed away April of 1999 with 28 years clean but we're going to listen to greg tell you guys about the beginnings of the book right now i think the actual process started at least for this attempt but actively started in san francisco i mean the things that led up to that the writing letters the looking to people the encouraging people the right the, the phone calls and everything else those were all setting the stage. I, I really believe the actual process started in uh, San Francisco in 1977, the Seventh World Convention. And it grew from there. I want to read a letter that I think is real indicative that Bo sent me in December of 1977. And I think this letter really speaks to some of the spirit of the basic text uh, of, the, of, of the process. Dear Greg, guess who bought a typewriter? I hope you have a nice Christmas. This is December 16th, 1977. Please say hi to Lois and the baby. Hope to see you next year. I've gotten off to a rolling start on, with the writing. I've started umpteen pamphlets and worked on a few notes for the NA book. My friends here know of my efforts and I hope to get a few of them together soon for input and discussion. Hopefully this will take place here and elsewhere. Thank God it's begun. At this point, I feel we have to involve as many people as po as many as possible, and make sure we cover all, all to make to make sure we cover all points of view. Involving people might struggle the effort and controversy, but I really trust the spirit and believe that we'd be poor servants to leave them out. Somehow, if we could get our best minds working to get working on this in harmony. I just know it would strengthen the gut of the program. In my thinking, it has occurred to me what we're up against, like is NA a cure for addiction? How to help doctors learn to treat or react to addiction? I would hate to see any valid point of view left out. Also, I would hate to see any great length of time elapse without some progress. Please write to me, my friend, your friend Bo. So, this is in 1977 that Greg gets this letter from Bo. This is after the Seventh World Convention in San Francisco. And as you can see, Bo is kind of, uh, he's, he's working on, well, just getting some of the things he values down there. But I think what's important is, is that this is, at this point right here, he's thinking of inclusiveness already. Uh, it talks about involving people might struggle the effort in controversy but I really trust the spirit and believe we'd be poor servants to leave them out. And then he goes on to say, somehow if we could get our best minds working on this in harmony, I know it would just strengthen the gut of the program. Uh, he was reaching a little bit here. He talks about how, you know, is NA a cure for addiction? And then still, you know, hadn't quite got a complete focus yet on the, the points of the book is do, you know, do we help doctors learn how to treat addiction? Um, so it's a very important letter right here, and I'll give you guys a real quick um, backstory with this thing. This is um, 
this letter, uh, Bo had a fire in his house a few years ago and all of his um, archives got burned up except for this particular letter because um, I still have this letter. And it's basically, this is where a character defect became a character asset because I had actually procrastinated getting this to Bo. And then, of course, Bo had the event of this house burning down, and, and, uh, and so we still have the letter, though. So basically, my, um, my procrastination, which was a uh, character defect, ended up turning into a character asset, and that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. So, I mean, right along. Yeah, the important thing that's a takeaway for, for everyone is that it's important to preserve your history, you know, your home group, your your area, your region, you know. So if you have uh, documents, uh, a real service that you can do for for the fellowship is to to digitize and preserve your local uh, local history. And again, some people are kind of questioning this line. Guess who bought a typewriter for our younger members? This is a typewriter. So we see that Jimmy and Greg actually start to encourage Bo. Uh, so we know that in January of 1979, Bo actually sent out a letter to the fellowship asking for input. And Bo told me that, that both Greg, Greg first started out by encouraging him to write a letter. And he says, I just, I really didn't feel comfortable doing it because I was not an elected uh, trusted servant on a world level. And so Jimmy calls him up and uh, says, starts talking to him and says, well, well, Bo, you're actually part of the World Service Office Literature Committee. And Bo told me that he was thinking inside of his head. He says, I was. When did I get elected to that? But mm -hmm. obviously mm -hmm. Bo, you know, decided to do it. And he put in there, he says, people who could be helped are dying every day from our disease. And I want you, you know, we put that in red because you're going to see that being a theme all through this. And what he also put in there, a few of us can't do this alone. We need your help. Please send your stories and articles. And this is the World Service Office Literature Committee in Marietta, Georgia. And that will be the only letter you ever see from uh, there. So Bo gets elected to... In April of 1979, he gets elected to as the chairperson of the World Lit Committee. And boy, things really, truly, it's it's happening now. It's on. So letters start going out to the fellowship. One of them's in the main the main line, which was in Northern California. It was a regional service letter. We have a copy of it right there on the screen for you. And I'm going to read a couple of places that we really and truly found pretty fascinating that were in the main line. One of them is, we now have literature committees in Venice, California, San Bernardo Valley, Wichita, Kansas, Scranton, PA, Atlanta, Georgia, and perspective committees in Minneapolis and Miami. And it goes on to say, the literature committee in San Bernardo Valley is working on collecting material on where our literature has come from in the past. The chairperson of the committee is a volunteer worker at the WSO. We have already copied our mail outs to make them available to ASC members. Trusted servants like this are making the dream of new in a literature come true. And one of the things that's really fun about looking at this, some of this, these old newsletters and so forth, it just the little things you find. So, Kind of in the bottom part of this, it says Narcotics Anonymous says no big shots, no little shots, one shot and we're all shot. That's great. So a little bit further down the line here in August the 21st of 1979, there's been a scheduled in Wichita, Kansas. And this is kind of the letter going out to announce it. It says, we all need to attend the Wichita Conference for NA Literature. October 6th and 7th will be here soon. And Bo goes on to say, he says, I've discovered that God wants our book. God, as I understand him, is hungry for NA Literature, has been waiting for years. But it, he mentioned something very, very important here at the end. 
is we don't need hundreds of members trying to get others to write. We need hundreds writing. So the World Lit Conferences is how the book was assembled. It was uh, written between October 79 and January 82. Th these are not final numbers or complete numbers. You know, part of each presentation is a hope that other people will step forward and share more information for more complete history. And it's kind of why we call it a history of the basic text because it's not complete. But from the minutes, we found 412 addicts participated from 25 different states. We know that there were addicts that attended World Lit Conferences that didn't sign uh, in on the minutes. Uh, and there's also countless other unknown addicts who contributed through local literature committees and just through individual submissions. So while we focus a lot on the literature conferences, there's a whole bunch of other addicts that were involved with this process. This is the flyer for the uh, first World Lit Conference. It was a two-day conference. The theme is You Are the Book. Uh, and it says, I would, you know, check here if you'd like to stay in an NA, NA member's home. And this, again, is kind of a reference back to the context that this is not a funded project, you know, that people have to get there on their own uh, and, and pay for the expense associated with this without fellowship or, or World S Service Office support. Uh, there just wasn't the money at that time. Um, there were 25 uh, addicts that registered and 34 uh, from six states that were listed in the minutes coming from California, Georgia, Kansas, Nebraska, Tennessee, and Virginia. And we're gonna listen to a clip with Joseph P talk about going to Wichita. Uh, and it was actually Joseph P's uh, archives that we got through Kermit back in uh, 2008 that we were able to digitize uh, that contained a lot of the minutes that served as the initial foundation for this presentation. And I was told about the uh, first World Literature Conference that was coming up a few months later up in up in Kansas. And so I'd arranged for some, the bow to come back, uh, come through Memphis and pick me up and go up there. I didn't know what it was going to be about. And on the way, talked about a lot of things. And, and we talked about we were going to write this wee book. And they kept talking about for days this wee book we're going to write. And, they, and all this information that Greg had and other people had was getting pals and the copy machine was right and i couldn't figure out how they're going to get all this material in a small book and it went on and on and on and what i finally figured out after that commission is the we book is that we together and not small but i never asked um so that's where i was so what i, I love about this is the kind of the misperceptions. Uh, and I think there could be an entire book dedicated to NA misperceptions. I have a sponsee who, when he attended his first meeting, uh, they were handing out the key tags and they gave a welcome key tag and then they gave a 30 day key tag. And he says, I can pledge to do 30 days. Uh, not quite understanding, you know, that you pick it up when you get there, not as a, you know, a commitment in advance. But what came out of this World Lit Conference is this handbook for Narcotics Anonymous literature committees that provided guidance so that writing could occur uh, throughout the fellowship. And Boyd referenced this in the letter earlier on uh, that Bo wrote in August of 79. A core value that emerged uh, through this literature conference was that input was encouraged, actively sought, and highly valued from all members of the fellowship, regardless of clean time and experience. So a lot of inclusion, and you see this core value contained in many places in the handbook. Right on page one, it says, every member is welcome to contribute material to this effort. We need all types of stories, and yours might be just the one to help your type of addict. We ask all members to send in their material without worrying too much if it is any good or not. Some of the best is probably in trash cans right now. I mean, and that's that therapeutic value of one addict helping another, understanding the insecurities and fears that people may have and not wanting to participate because of uh, not having the confidence and so forth. And just an invitation to say, just, you know, contribute. Um, it says in here, uh, in a real sense, ours is a movement of the message from those who have it to those who are dying for it. Again, that, that kind of motivation that addicts are dying. Um, and then uh, profanity. We usually ask the audience at this point, you know, what do you think it said about profanity? And uh, there, I cannot uh, overstate, you know, the significance of this insight uh, and decision by um, those involved with writing the handbook. They decided that stories can include slang, but not profanity, since this would limit the availability of our book in some areas and institutions. 
So really recognizing that, you know, the warden may not take this book or allow this book into their prison or the hospital administrator wouldn't allow it into the institution based on the language and um, recognizing that a lot of addicts, you know, are in institutions and prisons and jails. Um, you know, just the forethought in that I thought was really remarkable. Um, and again, uh, like all any literature, profanity will be edited to ensure that our message is widely available. The only place that we use profanity is here. This is like an example of some of the input that was submitted that was in Joseph P's archives. It was just a half sheet of paper and it just says the word fuck should not be used. You know, and this is like what's sent in and, um, and considered for, um, you know, for, for input. Page of this um, literature uh, manual here uh, is actually, it's got a, a page on topics and this is for topics of the literature committees, just suggestions of topics that they can write on. And Chris and I, we just highlighted three of them that we thought were really uh, interesting. Uh, the first one that we thought was interesting that your literature committee could write on, if you so choose to, is beer and grass was no excuse. The second one is little old ladies can get sick too. And the third one, I've got to admit, I've just never seen any actual writing on this one anywhere at all called 13th Stepping. And we don't know if that was to be a cautionary tale or an instructional writing. Uh, this, this history keeps evolving and you know a couple of years ago uh, Motorcycle Ed sent us this picture and said hey I found this photo of us from the first World Lit Conference in 1979. And, you know this is why we're so excited to continue to evolve this presentation as more history becomes available. The second World Lit Conference is held 11 months later. So a lot of time goes by between the first and the second. But the second one is a little bit longer. It's a six day conference and it's held in Lincoln, Nebraska. But you can still see the influence of Alcoholics Anonymous. The theme is come help us write the big book. And you had 36 members from eight states, uh, California, Georgia, Kansas, Nebraska, Ohio, Oregon, Pennsylvania, and Tennessee. And you had a member from uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. We know that seven members who were at the Wichita uh, Literature Conference attended this, so that provided some continuity both to process and um, you know, format. And importantly, there were a couple of board of trustees that attended as well, Bob B and Greg P. So this is Bob B right here. Bob is a member of the board of trustees. Mm -hmm. The story in the basic text is titled, I Found the Only NA Meeting in the World. And sadly, he passed away in June of 2015 with over 53 mm -hmm. years of recovery. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, Bob Barrett was probably the best goodwill NA ambassador NA has ever had. A very gentle spirit there and a very nice man. But what was very important that happened at the second World Lit Conference was that both uh, Bob and Greg showed up and that actually ended up lending a lot of weight to this movement if you will because a lot of folks on the California coast just kind of wondered what these folks on the east coast were really up to and you know didn't pay it a whole lot of attention but with two members of the board of trustees coming back coming out there and getting behind it, it started lending validity to the movement. And a very important decision was made at this one, and, and Greg suggests using the chapters from the White Book as an outline for the chapters of the in a Big Book. Uh, Bo, in his book, A Story of the Basic Text, he actually believes that this is something that Greg and Jimmy had talked about before, and it was basically mm -hmm. Greg and Jimmy's idea. There were two additional chapters were added just for today, living the program, and more will be revealed, which Greg envisioned as a version of AA's A Vision for You. And how we learned that was by listening to the tapes of the second World Lit Conference. So I'm going to introduce you to a man now named Jim N. 
Now, Jim is actually the chairperson of this conference. And he lived in Lincoln, Nebraska. He got clean in, 19, in November of 71. He passed away in December of uh, 2013, right before his 42nd anniversary. And uh, these, this is just a memory that needs to be reserved. And, I, and so mm -hmm. as you're listening to Jim, Chris actually brought this up one time. He says, I want you to think about this. Think about when your sponsor asks you to do something. Maybe drive across town to pick up that sponsee uh, uh, or that new person and take them to a meeting. Uh, you know, just anything that may rub you a little bit the wrong way of doing some service work. And listen to what Jim and some other folks do. Well, my neighbor offered me a ream of paper and the use of his copy machine, so that wasn't the problem. The problem was postage. So there were five of us sitting around the kitchen table at my place one day, and I just made the comment, well, I guess I've sold blood for sold plasma to, to support my hand. I think we can probably make a trip to the plasma center and get a a pint of blood is $15 and a roll of stamps is $15 and so the guys all went down the blood bank and, and sold blood and we went back to the house and laughing and joking and each of us had a roll of stamps in our pocket and we used to address players and sent them to every address that I could get my hands on. So think about that. These guys gave blood in order to get money to buy stamps to send out flyers announcing this conference. Um, I don't know about you, but I just kind of get a little bit of goosebumps when I think about that. But that's definitely willing to go to any lengths. And um, you know, thank you, Jim. My hat's off to you. It speaks again to the whole idea of inclusion, of one, you know, wanting to include everyone, and that we're better with, you know, the everyone's input and participation. Now, kind of along this uh, theme of, you know, support and everything, um, we're going to listen to George R. Uh, kind of share some of his experience. And again, it's really similar to uh, sacrifice and then support from uh, the fellowship. Uh, George got clean in uh, 1977. His story, It Won't Get Any Worse, appears in the second through the fifth edition. And we'll listen to George talk about this. Bo kept telling me to go to uh, the World Convention and then the Second World Literature Conference in Lincoln, Nebraska. The Tenth World Convention was in Wichita, Kansas. We were broke. I mean, we had no money. I was 20 years old. And uh, uh, I actually, to go to that, I sold my washer and dryer. And I bought a train ticket because I couldn't afford to fly. Uh, and uh, it took me a day and a half to get out there on a the train. Now, when I got there, I had 70 bucks for uh, the four days at the convention, the seven days at the literature conference, and the day and a half train ride there and the day and a half ride back. Uh, I think I was broke before we got to the literature conference. I didn't have a place to stay. Uh, and this became an MO for the literature conferences. Just come. We'll, we'll figure all that stuff out when you get there, you know. During that uh, kind of 11 months between the first and second World Lit Conference, 800 pages of material uh, was collected uh, and it was assembled in a unique uh, fashion. Material was first cut and filed under different chapter headings. Uh, material was then pasted into topics within each chapter. This is an incredibly uh, laborious way to assemble input and to create a text. And we'll listen to Motorcycle Ed talk about that. I believe it's the second one they, they, uh, that I showed up at. The real treat for me was get to do what all the other people had got to do in kindergarten that I didn't get to do because I didn't get to go to kindergarten was little itty bitty scissors and cut up pieces of paper and take the paste stick and put it on the back and paste it on another piece of paper. And the kid in me, of course, I didn't know what to call it at that time, just went berserk. You know, hot diggity doggy dum. And we are uh, 
really excited because um, we have Motorcycle Ed here, uh, and he's going to share for a couple minutes about um, his reflections and experience with uh, with this and the writing of the basic text. And I just you know, want to personally thank uh, Motorcycle Ed for always being so encouraging and loving and supportive of Boyd and I, um, and just really being, um, you know, kind of uh, an elder statesman. Thank you. My name is Ed Nemanetti. Hey, Ed. Uh, you know, the first and foremost, uh, Chris and Boyd, uh, to me, were the modern day heroes because they put all this together and uh, is, you know, maintaining it. And, you know, the story about Jim and his guys that a lot of people don't get to know is all of them was heroin addicts. And for them to go put a needle in their arm to buy stamps. Uh, I had a guy ask me a couple of months ago about, he had heard the rumor that the basic text was written in blood. And I said, yeah, sure was. And of course, you know, at that time I didn't know about sacred ceremonies. I didn't know about how you honor stuff. And uh, today I do. And, you know, the whole writing of the text was a sacred event for me. You know, it's it was a whole, you know, five years of on and on. Uh, and it turned out to be, you know, uh, one of the main things that changed my life and changed the unknown number of other people, you know, and, you know, I still get emotional when I see this stuff and, you know, brings back memories about, you know, seeing Bo type at that little typewriter. I lived in Marietta, Georgia when I got clean and I'd go over to his house and be, he'd be at that little typewriter. The one on the screen is a, upgrade from what Bo really had, but that was electric on the screen. He, he had a manual and that's what we was using was manuals. We didn't, we didn't have electric typewriters till, you know, probably the sixth or seventh conference, but, um, you know, the, the real blessing is how many lives have been saved, you know, because of, dedication and because of dreams come true. Uh, so it, it's on and on. Every time I, you know, you think of one thing, it leads to another memory and it leads to another one. And, you know, getting to see some of these people that I ain't seen in 20, 30 years today, you know, is, is uh, heartwarming. You know, this, this old soul is warm. You know, but thank you for letting me be a part of. Thank you, Ed. We love you. Uh, you Ed. We put together uh, a very special ending for this presentation that I think uh, we'll, you'll appreciate very much and uh, just love you so much. Very much so, Ed. Very much so. And this is Charles K. right here. And Charles attended three of the World Lit Conferences. His story is an Indian without a tribe. It appears in the first through the fifth editions. And we're going to listen to Charles tell you a little bit about the cut and paste. Hi, everybody. I'm Charles Kay, and I'm an addict. Some of the things you might not, that they touched on a little bit, like the cut and paste, that's how the whole book was put together. People cutting single lines out, pasting them on paper, photocopying it, passing it out to like everybody here. You would read it and go, no, I don't like that. We want to change that. So you cut that out, you paste it again, you re-photocopy it, and you kept doing that till you got to something you liked in your workshop. Then it went to the main group, and the literature committee was doing consensus before consensus was popular. That's how every line of the book was approved by consensus. So now we've got the literature prayer here, and we're actually going to 
listen to George R. tell you a little bit about the literature prayer. Um, I have basic text on my phone. And what I read is uh, uh, what's it known as now the service prayer. Uh, to me, it's still known as the literature prayer because that's where it comes from. It talks about, you know, uh, help us write, you know, uh, before every conference meeting, every conference workshop, at our home workshops that, you know, we our own literature in Bucks County and in Philadelphia, before we started, we would read that prayer. And when that prayer was read, it was almost like, if I, I'm getting goosebumps now. Um, mm -hmm. Like the fog would roll in and, and you could just feel uh, everyone would release their control and you know and, and kind of let God's will take over because we were there for a purpose all right and we're going to listen to Charles K tell you a little bit more about it and we're, we're thrilled to have Charles joining us live to, to share about his experience and reflections oh so we okay <laughs> let's unmute hey, everybody <laughs> I'm an addict named Charles. You know, this prayer and what George was talking about probably had the most impact on me of anything when it came to writing the book because when we said that prayer and we truly asked God to make us an instrument, you could feel the presence just like you felt the guy sitting next to you. It was the most profound spiritual experience I've ever had in my life. And it was a continuing thing every time we got together. <clears throat> you know, it's like Ed was talking. It, it choked you up because you knew you were doing something great. And you knew you were doing something impactful. But you also knew it wasn't you. You couldn't take any credit for that. You knew that you were just a vehicle in the right place at the right time, and God was using you like you needed to be used. And the most amazing thing about that is, is, you know, you look at the 400 and something people that were at these things. I don't know what the actual number of people who are still clean is, but I guarantee you, it's probably 70, 80 percent because we all experience that. We all experience this God of our understanding coming in, taking everyday addicts from all walks of life, every corner, putting us together, and we were able to agree on things. I mean, how remarkable is that? You can't even get four people to agree where to go eat dinner, you know? But hundreds of us got together, invited God into this situation, and were able to come to a conclusion with what you have today as the basic text. And if I never do anything else the rest of my recovery, I've got that that will always be with me to the day I die. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Charles, very much. I really appreciate it. And, you know, I just, um, it's really a, a shout out goes to you uh, from Chris and I, just like with Motorcycle Ed and, and you guys being so um, open and accessible with all your stories and your time. And we just, Chris and I really appreciate it. Yep. So uh, one of the places that we find a lot of information out is in newsletters. And this one came out in October of 80, right after the Second World Lit Conference. And it's called the Rainbow Connection. It was printed out of Atlanta, Georgia. And is Bo here by any chance? Bo, oh, if you're here, you can raise your hand or message me. Message in the chat. Yeah, we've been looking for him. We're not sure he's here yet. Okay. We'll go ahead and read it, Boyd. Yeah, I'll do that. 
So this is a wonderful piece of history that we had hoped Bo would be able to read it because the truth is, although he's never said he wrote it, you know, I've looked at, Chris and I've looked at so much of his writing that we feel pretty positive he was, he wrote it. So I'm going to read you a couple of lines in here that I think is really important. It says, although relatively few of the Fellowship of Narcotics Anonymous stood in the Lincoln Federal Building in September of 1980, the spirits of our contributors and of those still suffering addicts were all around us, encouraging us, sharing with us their hope and their pain. Those who enjoyed the actual moment were but servants of a larger whole. You want the whole thing read, Chris, or just? Yeah, we'll just go to the next one, the last paragraph, which is so impactful. Yeah. yeah. As a result of addicts meeting in Lincoln, Nebraska in September of 1980, a book, a dream will be realized. But it would be inaccurate to say that we have written a book. We have all come from many parts of the country and many walks of life. We have all, by the grace of our higher power and the help of our fellow addicts, survived a killing disease. I'm going to repeat that. Survive a killing disease. In an effort to continue to survive, we have met here to share our experience, strength, and hope. The book is just a reflection of this effort. It is in this spirit that our book will come forth. Addicts all over the world will have Narcotics Anonymous for comfort and for study. When we find ourselves by ourselves, we need not be alone. We will have our book and we will have each other. At the end of the presentation, we'll kind of give you a timeline of the number of meetings worldwide by year. And at the time that this was written, to envision that this would be something that would be shared worldwide um, for addicts, uh, you know, is really amazing. The third World Lit Conference uh, is in Memphis, Tennessee, and it's only a few months after the second one. And we're going to listen to uh, Joseph P. talk about the decision to go to Memphis. I'm an addict from Memphis. My name is Joseph. Uh, they were going to set up a time to have the next one. And, of course, me being uh, the assertive self, a uh, good controlling addict that I was, I wanted to volunteer Memphis. Um, and so I did. And uh, of course, I was the only clean member in Memphis. But, uh, <laughs> but um, things worked out. And we had that uh, literature conference that the, um, the, the grade book came out of. One of the things that stood out to us uh, in this uh, Flyers, it says, with gratitude in our cleanliness, which is language we don't hear much today, at least in North Carolina. Uh, so we see uh, things have gotten a little more formal uh, in terms of registration with uh, typeset. Uh, Pre-registration's 12. We're also seeing uh, questions about whether uh, those attending are a member of Naranon, so you got some families getting involved. Uh, this is the longest uh, World Lit Conference to date. It's over a week long with 73 people attending from 14 different states. And um, I'm going to turn it over to, to Boyd here. Yeah, we're going to listen to George R. tell you about who, who they, they discussed, who they were actually writing the book for at this conference. At the Memphis conference, we talked about, uh, we talked about how this was going to change Narcotics Anonymous. And, and the purpose of us writing it was for um, addicts seeking recovery today, addicts that haven't used yet, and addicts that haven't even been born yet. Um, we knew this was long term. And for me today, sometimes I get asked to speak and it, uh, well, I, I got introduced as he's been around so long, he's been clean longer than I've been born. <laughs> before I was born, actually before my parents even met yet. <laughs> so 
So uh, this is actually a um, copy of the minutes from uh, January 31st of 1981. And there was a, a very important uh, decision that was made there, which was is they're trying to complete what, the final draft of the Narcotics Anonymous Big Book. So it's still being called the NA Big Book at this time. They wanted to get it submitted to uh, the World Service Conference two months prior to the service conference. We see the influence of uh, AA and the relate, you know, the cooperation with AA. There's a letter from the AA General Service Office to Bo uh, saying we send warm wishes for uh, a successful conference in Memphis. Uh, we see chapters uh, that are being worked on by the local literature committees. Um, and this is, again, you know, some of the stories that need to be explored and, and further uh, documented. Uh, Atlanta worked on chapter one, who's an addict. Uh, Greg P. worked on the 12 traditions, chapter six. Uh, chapter seven was submitted from San Francisco, recovery and relapse. Chapter eight, we do recover, was submitted by the Bristol Literature Committee in Pennsylvania. And chapter 10, more will be revealed, was submitted by the Philadelphia Literature Committee. And this is an example of some of the uh, input that we found in Joseph P's uh, archives and submitted by the Bristol Literature Committee. And um, I'll turn it back over to uh, Boyd at this point. Yeah, yeah, actually, and this was a picture that Al R had actually given to Chris a while back of the Bristol Literature Committee. And we actually have Al uh, scheduled to speak with us and tell us the story about that. So. Al, if you're there, it's your turn. I'm an addict by the name of Al. Uh, yeah, there's in that picture is uh, myself, uh, George, Pete, Pete B. He's in the meeting tonight. Uh, it was an apartment. Uh, Phil and Kenny had an apartment in Bristol, Pennsylvania, and uh, we, uh, I guess we we kind of got tired of uh, reading out of the. We we took the AA Big Book and we crossed out alcohol and put drugs, and we were just kind of tired of doing that. So. Uh, we started to work on uh, the writing, you know, doing some writing on basic text. And as you just cited, you know, we were working on chapter eight and George was involved with the Philadelphia Literature Committee too. Um, and uh, we would meet, you know, usually like on a Saturday night or whatever the case, was. probably half of us weren't working, but, um, and uh, so uh, we would meet and, and uh, spend some time, you know, we'd all kind of go off in our own little corner and, you know, write and then talk about it and, you know, you know talk about what, you know, what, what was good, what was not so good, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so that's, that picture is, is in, their, in their apartment, you know, during that time period. Thank you. Al, let me ask you a question. Um, let's see if we can put him back on here. I've often been curious. I mean, uh, the Bristol is how far away from Philly? Let's get you back on. Hold on. Okay. Well, Shane's got to unmute him. He's got to accept it. Al, you got to accept the unmute. Very uh, good. Al, I'm sorry. Sorry. Uh, as you leave Philadelphia, uh, Bristol is in Bucks County, about maybe 10 minutes north of the Philadelphia border, right on the Delaware River. The Delaware River goes right next to Philly. And as you go north up the Delaware River, you're in Bristol, about 10 so, minutes north of the border. Yeah, so why did you have uh, a literature committee in Bristol and one in Philly? I mean... Uh... Well, because uh, we had started one in Bristol, and then uh, the folks in Philly... Uh, wanted to start one and George kind of said to them, well, why don't you come down and join us? Uh, but they lived in the city, nobody had cars, so they couldn't get to Bristol at the time. So uh, what George did is he went down and, and uh, he, uh, he, he helped them to get one going in Philadelphia. His first one was like, everybody was packed together, you know, shoulder to shoulder in this room. And he actually, uh, he, he facilitated it from the hallway because there was just so there was people in the hallway there's people in the living room like they were so excited about it and you know that's kind of how the philadelphia literature committee got started that's awesome thank you thank and, you and now i also want to give a shout out to you too man chris and i really really appreciate all the the wonderful stories you've uh told us and your availability and it, it's just we really appreciate it thank you thank you so anyway, guys, I'm going to introduce you. Uh, well, I've already introduced you to a man named Greg P. But this is, um, if for those who didn't know, 
Greg actually wrote chapter six, the 12, uh, the basic text interpretations of the 12 tradition. And it was really interesting about how they, they came about um, getting what Greg wrote. Greg wasn't able to make it to Memphis. He was still in Oregon. So they talked about Greg driving down to Portland and air shipping it over to Memphis. And, uh, you know, that was going to take quite a bit of time. And they didn't really feel like they had that. So instead, they did something in a very unique way. Well, one of the things that, that did happen in Memphis was how long was the conversation phone call? Two calls totaling over nine hours. And a little gal sitting there, and they'd take turns typing. You know, one person would hold the phone to their ear, and they would type, and another person would rub their back so they wouldn't cramp up. And, you know, just over and over and over, times again of the selflessness. So that right there is Molly sitting on, can you see the arrow pointing to the, the briefcase that she's sitting on? And that's another indication of the selfless service. Um, I once asked um, Lois P, Greg's widow, if, um, if she remembered that phone call. And she said, oh yes, I remember it very much. We were actually paying for the call and our phone was cut off for about two months because at that time, you know, you were charged for long distance. And uh, so those were, you know, just some of the ways that, uh, that uh, well, people contributed. Bo once told me a story. He says, if you were a member of the literature committee and you didn't have your phone cut off once or twice, you just really weren't doing all that. So anyway, it's a pretty unique story that uh, it shows just what willingness they had to get us a book. Introduce you to a man named Jim M. Jim became involved at the Memphis Literature Conference. And despite business commitments, he flew back and forth between Ohio and Memphis several times uh, in February of 81 to help get the gray re review form prepared for distribution. And in Bob Stone's book, he said, Bo said that, it, well, actually, excuse me, Bo told me that Jim was relied upon to, care, to catch a logical flaw or carry out an approved plan of action. And so Jim hosted the Fifth World Literature Conference in Warren, Ohio. And by listening to the tapes of the Third World Lit Conference, we found out Jim was very instrumental in emphasizing consistent and fellowship specific language. And we're going to we're going to listen to Jim talk to you about the style sheet in just a minute. So Jim, this is the style sheet. And I'm going to give you things all it is is what we're trying to do is the same words will mean the same thing all the way through. Something came out of early uh, literature conference work that use the word you need. And, uh, just for, for example, I'll go through one example. Use the word or phrase clean in reference to the condition of abstinence from drugs or instead of clean and sober, clean and serene, straight or sober. Is that understandable? So that, that's uh, audio actually from the Third World uh, Literature Conference in, in Memphis. And this is, you can imagine input coming in from so many different places and, you know, trying to figure out how are we going to take all these different references to, to different words and phrases and, and put it into something that's uh, kind of universal for the, the basic text. Um, some of the most impactful stuff that I've, I've learned while researching the history has to do with group conscience. We're going to listen to Joseph P. Uh, discuss that. And at that conference, I think we really started to develop what, in our minds, or what uh, was spiritually attuned to what we thought group conscience was, is, is uh, writing in committee and writing in groups and, and letting everybody that wanted to be a part of and uh, not limiting anyone's participation for, what, for any, any reasons. 
And so we're going to be able to experience what group conscience uh, was like. This is going to be audio from the Third World Lit Conference in Memphis. And they're discussing uh, how to handle a particular topic. And we're going to listen to a woman named Gina and Bo and Dan kind of discuss uh, this. And it'll give us a real feel for kind of how group conscience was utilized. And I got to tell you, like learning about this stuff has really not only impacted me in terms of my own recovery and my service at a home group level, but really my professional life in a lot of ways, too. Um, I'm, I'm Gina, and I'm definitely an addict. Hi, Gina. Um, Okay, the way they handled a lot of this in the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous is by referring you to the appendix at the end and really expounding on the teaching on the spiritual concept and the fact that it's not um, that it's not any one particular kind of God. I think it would really help for us to have a short appendix, a short but very to the point appendix. Well, I know that there's people here that I've said about this now, and I want to give um, a, a brief statement from everybody about this and go around to everybody well they may, they may not let's let's hear from them in a very brief form one in order just all the way around and no repeat until we get around no discussion until we get around then we'll have a feel for what the group has to say and then get into the video no I think that right there really is what kind of impacted me, you know, the commitment with a room full of, you know, 40, 50 people to say, we're going to listen to every person, you know, we're not going to cut them off. We're not going to ask questions. There's no jumping in after you shared saying, Hey, one more thing. And we're just going to practice listening to each person at the end of that. We'll have a feel for what the group conscience is. Um, and so Dan starts off, you know, kind of sharing his experience with this and, He's the first of many to, to contribute to what would become the group conscience on this topic. I'm Dan, I'm an addict. And, Dan, and uh, I uh, sort of the same position as that here. I didn't like uh, people to talk about God much. <laughs> when the treatment had got my stuff together a little bit, I like the idea of the uh, higher power. Uh, and I like the freedom that that gave me. I wanted to consider the stars and the moon, or if I wanted to consider the sunlight or whatever. It's just a higher power thing. And it is a very important subject to be discussed, I agree. Um, now, you know, I, it doesn't offend me now, you know, God, I, I believe in God now. I didn't then. The high power is good now, and then God is good for right now. There's a couple of things you hear in uh, these old audio cassettes. You hear uh, tear, chairs kind of scratching across the floor and you hear lighters. And so in one of the slides that we were looking at, one of the photos, ashtrays all over the place. And the question is, did you get clean when you could smoke in meetings? Uh, interestingly, with meetings being on Zoom, uh, I've seen more people smoking in meetings than I have in 30 years. Um, there was a telegraph uh, that was sent, or telegram that was sent by uh, Jimmy to the folks at the Third World Lit Conference, and it said, the full fruit of a labor of love lies in the harvest, and that always comes in its right season, yours in fellowship uh, and love, Jimmy Kinnon. And Boyd and I always managed to fall into rabbit holes, and we did at just about 520 today as we're prepping for the presentation. We started saying, when did that start appearing in the basic text? And we found that it appeared for the first time uh, in the third edition of the basic text uh, in October of uh, 84. The, his quote appears there in the beginning of the foreword. Um, this is what it looked like to sell, send a telegram at that time. So here's the progress in Memphis. Uh, this was put out on actually Thursday, not even uh, you know, fully through the conference yet, just partly through. And it says, first, a great deal of groundwork was accomplished at Wichita and Lincoln conferences mm -hmm. that only now be in evidence. Second, that a great deal of work has been done since Lincoln Literature Conference by individuals and areas, and that their work has been unseen until Memphis. And third, and probably the greatest factor of all, is that the potential for new literature is built up in the spoken traditions of Narcotics Anonymous over the last 20 years. 
And just to kind of point out again, it says the 1,440 service hours put in by Thursday. Uh, and, and it's just to speak to the amount of effort that was put into uh, this book. Um, uh, one of the things we've been uh, trying to do is to capture more voices of women uh, and their role in the writing of the basic text. And we're really excited that we got a chance to interview Linda M. Uh, last November. She attended all seven world literature conferences and served as the librarian. Her story, Pothead, appears in editions one through five of the basic text. And we'll listen to her talk about Memphis. So I, I was always lightweight. <laughs> you know, went home by midnight kind of thing. But I stayed up for like 40, 41, 42 hours during this time frame because there was this urgency where we realized that every hour that went by in addict was out there dying uh, with nothing, absolutely nothing. And so there was this urgency. We got to get it done. We got to get it done. That just kind of, you know, emphasizes again uh, that theme that we've heard going back to Bo visiting the Seventh World uh, Convention. At the end of the, the Third World Lit Conference, they had a um, banquet and the cake was uh, the NA Big Book, so we still are using that, that language. Uh, what happened after the literature conference was the assembling of uh, the, the review form, and this was done by uh, Joseph P., um, and the Gray Review form gets printed in February of 1981. It's self-funded uh, by the, world, the people attending the World Lit Com uh, Conference and the fellowship funds it. And, you know, it's a very intentional way of including the fellowship for input. So the Gray Review form, each page, uh, each line on each page is numbered. And you can, you would get this review input form and you could put your name, your area, and you could check off, we find the material complete and satisfactory in its present form, or two, in order for our book to be complete and satisfactory, we recommend the following corrections. And then you could say page number, line number, and put your comments. And I mean, this is one of the places where we're really excited to, to try to get more um, input uh, about people's experiences uh, if they were involved in submitting um, review and comment uh, from the Gray Review Form. And this is a, a photo of them being assembled and uh, them being uh, shipped off. And we found a uh, air freight slip uh, to Jimmy Kinnon, uh, sending him Gray Review Form number one, which is uh, the picture of it here. It says, Jimmy, your personal copy and the first off the press for the archives, love Roger. Excuse me. So now we've got the fourth literature conference, which is <clears throat> held in Santa Monica, California. And it's actually right before the World Service Conference. And its theme mm -hmm. was, you've seen the book and the time has come. Uh, it was the conference that had the most people attended, which was 146 people attended. Um, And they were from 15 different states. Okay. And here's something that uh, uh, that we thought was really a, from the fellowship in Iowa. It says, our prayers and thoughts are with you, hoping for the reality of our big book. And that, that came from uh, Council Bluffs, Iowa. And here's a picture of the first book that was at first gray review form that was used at the 1981 service conference and you can see all the people that attended and uh and signed it so it's pretty cool yeah so you see motorcycle ad uh you see linda's name on here uh a whole whole bunch of other folks that are on The Fifth World Lit Conference is held shortly after the World Service Conference. Um, same theme, it's uh, in Warren, Ohio from June 29th to July 5th. 115 uh, people attended from 18 different states. And um, we'll listen to Jim uh, talk about what he did to help his wife and other members get to Warren, uh, Ohio. I sold a motorcycle to Jim. I sold him the bike for $1,500, if my memory serves me correctly, and 
I uh, was Donna's uh, bike in my mind, so she took the fifteen hundred dollars and uh, went to the went took a couple of vans full of people to the conference in Ohio. This is uh, Sally E. Sally got clean uh, September 1st, 1969. She was on the board of trustees and passed away three days shy of her 45th anniversary. And we'll listen to her recall the World Literature Conference. You know, there's a lot of things that happened with writing that book and a lot of miracles. And in Ohio, we were divvying up the workload and there was a guy and he raised his hand and he said, I can't read and I can't write, but I can cook. And if each of you will give me $3 a day, I'll fix you some good meals. And he did. That guy was so special. I mean, it was so special that he had the courage to do that. How many of us would have been able to do that? He only had a few months. He didn't have that much time. And by the way, uh, Bob B tells me he's still clean today. It's just a great story of inclusion, you know, finding a way for uh, people to contribute in whatever way they're capable of contributing. As Chris and I were, um, were creating this PowerPoint, we had a kind of a working a title to it called Blood, Sweat, and Tears, and that one being the tears part. Listen to Charles K. again. Me and Tom, we hitchhiked from Santa Monica to Warren, Ohio for the Lit Comp. And I mean, amazingly, it was like one of those God things where you got rides that would take you full states or two states over and you'd be on the road for maybe 10 minutes and somebody else would pick you up. Well, we hitchhiked there, stayed in Warren. Then we went from Warren we were going to Miami. So we went through Philly, hitchhiking still, down the coast, stop offs in DC, Atlanta, and then, you know, made it down to Miami. Nope, don't know anybody. I knew Bob, it's like, Bob, we're coming into town. All right, I got a place for you to stay. Hooked us up at somebody's house, you know, and then I ended up staying. It was like nothing was planned. It's like, well, that's where the world convention is going to be. And then the lit conference is after that. So that's we're going to be going. there. So now we've got the six world lit conference in Miami, Florida. And actually Charles was the chairperson of that. So the theme is that others may find the freedom of recovery that we have found. 60 people attended from 15 different states. But what's important about this one also is that a lot of the people from California, the world trusted, uh, the world level trusted servants had come to Miami for the uh, convention. And so a lot of them stayed over afterwards to work on the final edit of the basic text, if you will. We're going to give you the, the uh, sweat part of the blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> yeah, right now. There's got it. We're going to, well, I'm going to call this guy Mr. Anonymity. And he had a really special way about getting to Miami. I can't wait for you to hear this story. Yeah, one of the questions you had was about, you know, the trip going down to the Miami Lit Conference from like, an, and basically that was, you know, 81, riding my bike from, my bicycle from Lincoln down to, down to Miami. I wish I could tell you it was um, well thought out and planned, but it, it really wasn't. It was more just like I wanted to get down for the lit conference. I wanted, I wanted to go to the convention as well, but it was more to get to the lit conference in Miami. And it was an adventure. I was still a kid. And it was uh, it was something exciting to do. And it, at that point, I had experienced so much with the different lit conferences, I knew I was going to be able to find people along the way and find people once I got down there that I'd be able to to survive. And I, I guess I wanted more of that fellowship at that point. It was it was truly a, a just for today kind of kind of a process. It was you know get on the bike and, and ride and do do 100 miles or so and, and keep going the next day. 
This was pre-Google, so we're not sure his exact route, but this is how Google Maps would take you if you want to bike from Lincoln to Miami. So now we're gonna we're gonna listen to Charles K. tell you a little bit about the conference. At the Six Literature Conference, we read each line and voted on every single line. Not whole chapters, not pages or paragraphs, but every line. And as I read each line, I would check yes or no. If it was a no, it went back and got worked on. And that's where the white approval form came from, was that conference there after every line had been approved, then that was made up and sent out as something that, here's our book. Here's what we're offering to you as a finished product. And the approval form was actually printed and first distributed at the very first uh, Tennessee Regional or Tennessee Volunteer Regional. And uh, I think it was Thanksgiving of 1981. And then after the new year, the Seventh World Lit Conference came and it was held in Philadelphia. It was uh, four days, 67 people attended from seven different states. And it was held here in this particular house who I think, if I'm not mistaken, it was Al, George, and Pete lived there. Um, and I, I'm totally amazed, guys, because I really look at this house and think 67 people traveled through this thing over a weekend, a long weekend. Uh, but this is actually the product that they, they produced, is this right here, which is a, um, this is the, this is the basic, this is the draft, if you will, for the stories that was sent out. Uh, had all the stories over there. You can see on the columns, do you want this one, that one, yes or no. Uh, it also has right there, it's interesting to Chris and I that it says there at the end, do you want to hear, uh, how do you want to deal with the references to AA? So even at this late date, they're still doing some processing of that. The following slides just kind of show the involvement of people who attended the World Lit Literature Conferences um, from where they were geographically. Again, this doesn't speak to the folks that contributed from local literature committees or their individual submissions, but you can see more folks are getting involved uh, from around the United States uh, through these. When we looked at the minutes, um, you know, the majority of people attended one of the World Lit Conferences. And um, what that tells us is that there were people that provided kind of the continuity uh, by attending multiple literature conferences. So you had Bo and Linda at all seven, Hank and Joseph at six, Doug, Jim, Teresa, and Tom at five, and, and so forth. Uh, we're very fortunate. Uh, we were able to get audio from, uh, uh, from NAWS. Uh, of the uh, 1982 World Service Conference where the basic text is approved and we're gonna play that for you now. And we have a vote, we have a vote. Let's not confuse it. Uh, I'll clarify that I'm out of order, but I'll clarify that that can be decided whether it's you know, white or blue or fat or tall or Okay, the, we're, we're going to have a vote now. All in favor of accepting the basic text approval form as the first edition of our Narcotics Anonymous book. Please stand. The book is passed. So, for the longest time, all we had was a little piece of paper that said we have a book and we showed you from the motions. But um, Chris and I were out at the World Service office one time and we 
begged if we might be able to get that. And they said that uh, they would see. And uh, they actually wanted you guys to be able to hear it. So, you know, it's really interesting because uh, one of the problems that came up is how are we going to fund this printing of the book? Because if you remember, the World Service Office did not even fund this whole project. And so we found a letter actually in Greg Fee's archives. And so I think the, you know, uh, the idea originated from him is that they make a special edition and they charge a special price for it and they pre-sell it in order to be able to get money up to give to the publisher to be able to publish the book. And that's exactly what happened. And so this right here is a, um, a letter that actually uh, said that you could order the NA Big Book, okay? And they wanted $25 for it. So in 1982, $25 was a hefty sum of change. And this is what, uh, this is it right here. Now, if you, if you ordered it, this is a card that you got back from the, um, the office saying that, uh, you know, they received your check and that uh, it will be sent to you no later than November of 1982, uh, but unfortunately it didn't quite happen that way. So here is a, uh, a picture of the, that special edition. They called it the DNA Basic Text Red. They're, they're numbered editions. There's a few out there that are unnumbered. And, uh, but this one right here is the blue edition. And this is what was put on the table for meetings and uh, sold to, as a non-special. I'm not sure exactly. I think they sold it for $8 at that time. Uh, eight something and some change. And here's a picture of uh, a silver edition. Now there are only two of these, and the story behind them is is that, see what happened is in the 11th hour, uh, the money that Jimmy had given to the printer to print the basic text, this guy took drunk and actually took off with our money. And it was a considerable amount of money. And the uh, person who was the president of the World Service Office at that time, and that was not Jimmy, was another person, knew somebody in the publishing industry, and her name was Jeannie. And so she actually was our uh, angel that came to us in the 11th hour and helped uh, Jimmy and the office get this, and the board of trustees and all the people out there get this book published. And uh, so she actually had two, two of these made, and we have pictures here of the inscriptions in both. And one of them is to you know, from Jeannie to Jimmy, and one of them is from, you know, to Jeannie from Jimmy. And um, pretty special editions right there. Here's a picture of the very first book off the press, and uh, Jimmy wanted that so that he could actually weigh it, uh, so he would know how much it was going to cost to ship it. Um, here's a picture of the only uh, in a soft cover first edition. And the story behind this is that the person who uh, printed it or bound them, I'm not exactly sure which, was actually did the Oscars of that year. And so uh, he felt that this was such a Oscar worthy uh, presentation of a book, he actually made this for Jimmy. And uh, so here is a picture of the one millionth copy of the basic text, which was, uh, these were commemorative editions printed in 1988. Here's the 20th anniversary, which is printed in 2002. Here's the 25th, 2008. And here's the 30th edition, 30th anniversary edition printed in 2013. And um, so I got to tell you guys something about the last line of the first edition. In the very first edition, there's Tom C's story, Mid-Pacific Serenity. And originally it was the last chapter in the basic text. And so in the first edition and first edition only, the very last line reads, God is loving us now. And that's just so cool. 
And I would not have known that had Tom not told me that at uh, a uh, fundraiser that was done down in Miami along for the East Coast Conference a long time ago. So, the impact of the book, uh, it unified the message and language of Narcotics Anonymous. Uh, Bob Stone says that NA would not have had the financial resources to meet the challenges that growth in the 80s afforded. And again, this growth, you know, I, I referenced this earlier. Um, this is a, a timeline of meetings worldwide. So in 53, we had a meeting, had a couple meetings in, the, in 60. When Bo goes to the Seventh World Convention, there's only 764 meetings worldwide. When the Basic text comes out in 83, there's 3,382 meetings. And as of the most recent uh, World Service Conference, uh, there's 76,000 worldwide meetings now. And this growth that occurred after the basic text came out is just unbelievable. There was a small dip, Boyd gets clean here. You can see that worldwide meetings drop pretty significantly. I speculate that, you know, he hadn't worked the steps yet, so he's pretty, probably pretty obnoxious to be around. He works the steps and people start coming back in and meetings start, you know, growing again in Narcotics Anonymous. Without the book, the message of NA could have become fragmented. The fellowship could have been eclipsed by other recovery movements. And here's the amazing thing. If we go back to the Rainbow Connection and what it talked about, about addicts around the world will have the book for comfort and for study. You know, that was written in 1980. Uh, we go back to George R. talking about we are writing this for addicts today, addicts that haven't come into the room yet, addicts who haven't started using yet, addicts who haven't been born yet. When we think about Motorcycle Ed and uh, the folks talking, uh, Charles talking about the literature prayer, you know, here's where we are today. The basic text is printed in 33 languages, making the message of Narcotics Anonymous available to so many others. And Boyd and I just finished a very special project where we ask people to read a step or a tradition in their language. And this is our first time uh, presenting this very special ending uh, to the history, a history of the basic text. Na corte foi anônimo. Se você quer o que nós temos a oferecer e está disposto a fazer um esforço para obtê-lo, então está preparado para dar certos passos. Estes são os princípios que possibilitaram nossa recuperação. Abbiamo ammesso di essere impotenti sulla nostra dipendenza e che la nostra vita era divenuta ingovernabile. Πήραμε την απόφαση να παραδώσουμε τη θέλησή μας και τη ζωή μας στη φροντίδα του Θεού της κατανόησής μας. 4. Sin miedo hicimos un detallado inventario moral de nosotros mismos. Trin 5. Vi ενδρομε for Gud og selv og det andet menneske vor far sande natur. Ni e bjakmi na polno gotovi. Bog da odstrani vsichki tezi defekti od charaktera ni. Stap 7. Ons het om nederig vra om ons te kortkomende te verbeide. Kita membuat daftar orang-orang yang telah kita sakiti dan menyiapkan diri untuk memperbaikinya kepada mereka semua. המשכנו בחשבון נפש אישי, וכאשר שגינו, הודינו בכך מיד. סייאן מנחילה לתועאי ותעמול אלא תחסין סילתנא אלוואי אבילה, על הקדרי פהמינה דעינה פקד אני מנחנא אלמעריפה למשיאתה, לנא ולקוו עלה תנפידיה. ובידרי רוחני האסל אז ברדשתן אין קדם הו, מר כושידין אין פיום רו במותדן ברסלים, ואין אוסור רו דר תמם ומרזת יחוד בישרה דר אבל. Det här låter som ett jättearbete och vi kan inte göra alltihop på en gång. Vi blev inte beroende på en dag. Så kom ihåg, ta det lugnt. 
on yksi asia, joka enemmän kuin mikään muu voi tehdä tyhjäksi toipumisemme. Välinpitämätön tai suvaitsematon asenne hengellisiin periaatteisiin. Tarvitsemme välttämättä niistä kolmea. Rehellisyyttä, ennakkoluulottomuutta ja halukkuutta. Niiden avulla pääsemme jo hyvän matkaa eteenpäin. Wij zijn van mening dat onze benadering van de ziekte verslaving volkomen realistisch is, aangezien de therapeutische waarde van een verslaafde die een andere helpt zonder weerga is. Wij menen dat onze manier praktisch is, want de ene verslaafde kan het best de andere verslaafde begrijpen en helpen. Wij geloven dat hoe eerder wij onze problemen in het dagelijks leven onder ogen zien, hoe sneller wij aanvaardbare, verantwoordelijke, en productieve leden van onze maatschappij zullen worden. Als ik het dan weet, ja, dat daar wordt maar een pas op die psychische als we nemen pas naar je pas te zijn, zo hebben we. Voor ooit wat niet meer, als we voelen dat we die eigen schok is er dan zo snel erlebt. Eerst met een handschoen zoek naar publiek, ik heb al niet druk op pas naar je, wat ik heb een naar schik van hij heeft verschrikkelijk, of voor uur op een lepest die psychische inzicht. Pode ir esse álcool, ele que é médica, que toque ali narcótica, logo ele precoce o mui a ter de preatcrítico. Prestei que me assetei a minha na, logo ele se chamou esse álcool, ele esquerdo ou não narcótico. Mas nós não pegamos essa aula e esse clíster, isso é a cláusula. Álcool ele será narcótico. Mas essa é a mesma aula, essa é a gente se precoce o mui bem se liga. Todo ele não iria dar-me se veio que privá-lo, mas se se liga que não é bem que o narcótico. Mas essa é a gente que tem que ter uma noite,用心を怠ってはならない。一人一人の自由が十二のステップによってもたらされているように、十二の伝統はグループに自由をもたらす。Notre bien commun devrait passer en premier. Le rétablissement personnel dépend de l'unité de narcotiques anonymes. Für den Sinn und Zweck unserer Gemeinschaft gibt es nur eine höchste Autorität, einen liebenden Gott, der er sich in unserem Gruppengewissen zu erkennen gibt. Unsere Vertrauensleute sind nur betraute Dienerinnen und Diener. Sie herrschen nicht. Единственным условием для членства в анонимных наркоманах является желание прекратить употребление. Анонимные наркоманы. Каждая группа должна быть независима в всех справах, с выявлением тех, которые дотычат других групп, или на яко целости. Katrai grupai ir tikai viens galvenais mērķis – nest vēsti par atveseļošanos atkarīgajam, kurš joprojām cieš. Virnakotik Anonomus grubu her hangi bir ilgili kuruma veya dışında kalan girişime Nakotik Anonomus adına asla onay veya bu adı ödünç vermemeli. Bu ad ile maddi destekte bulunmamalıdır ki para, mülk ve prestij sorunları Tradisi itu jo setiap kumpulan NA seharusnya mampu menampung diri sepenuhnya tanpa menerima apa-apa sumbangan dari luar. Anonimi narkomani bi trebali za uvek ostati neprofesionalni, jako naši uslužni centri mogu zapošljavati plaćene djelatnike. Parampara no, NA jesi hehe kabi sengetit nahi hona čili, लेकिन हम सेवा परिषद या समितियां निर्माण कर सकते हैं जो सीधे उनके प्रति उत्तरदायी होंगे जिनकी वो सेवा करते हैं थी इन तो अर्धा बनिया मैं कॉलेज समान मिस है वे इनका स्कूल ना इतना कमेटी मामले में ताकि सक ना इतना अल्ट्रा ड्रागन नाप अन्ना संतक ना इन्हीं अल्मेन आउटरिंग्स मार ट्रेडिशन थी Anonyme narkomane har ingen mening om utenforliggende spørsmål. Derfor bør enda-navnet aldri trekkes inn i offentlig strid. Olá, o meu nome é Joaquim e sou um adito. Décima segunda tradição. O anonimato é o alicerce espiritual de todas as nossas tradições. Lembrando-nos sempre a necessidade de colocar os princípios acima das personalidades. Obrigado. Mais 24. Again, looking back on uh, you know some of the material that was presented, uh, you know the writing in the Rainbow Connection in uh, October of 1980 of 
addicts around the world will have this book for comfort and for, for study. Uh, it just amazes me to see how many lives have been touched around the world because of the basic text. And this is, uh, again, where we generally get the most enjoyment from our presentation, where we ask people to share what the basic text has meant to you. And again, if you're joining late, uh, you can go to the basictexthistory.com and there's a, uh, a platform there for people to be able to submit their, uh, th their, their thoughts on this question, for you to be able to share with, uh, with the fellowship what the basic text has meant to you. And Boyd and I uh, want to extend our thanks uh, to um, the committee that helped put this together and the excellent job they did in, in uh, creating the platform for us to be able to present this material and to share it with you. And we're deeply uh, humbled and appreciative of the opportunity to participate in this tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much.